Well, what's crackalackin' everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Zapala here. Healing to you from Dallas, Texas, and welcome to another year. Happy New Year to you all. And another episode here of the Seven Figure Squad podcast. Coming to you live in studio with me today is a friend of mine from, what, 2010. We met, 2009, 2010, we met uh, doing a shooting for the show, The Invested Life Reality Show. I think it was the first ever personal finance reality show during the during the That's great recession right. and the best one and the best one yes right 100 percent. i totally agree you were representing dallas at the time right and i was representing chicago it was a multi-city type of show but it was sponsored by uh by msn money and td ameritrade but uh ed butowski is an internationally distinguished professional in investment wealth management he's featured in a critically acclaimed espn 30 for 30 feature called broke Exposing the chronicles of pro athletes' lack of financial literacy and, manage, and financial management, where just a few years after playing in pro sports, they end up sadly financially broke. Uh, managing partner of Chapwood Investments, and an honor to say we uh, rock together. Uh, and and uh, uh, we had a joint client we were working with in uh, what was that? In Albuquerque, New Mexico, it was an opera singer. Uh, you know, and uh, you were providing some investment guidance mm-hmm. uh, to him. And uh, also, I want to ask you about this later on. Is he's the creator of the Chapwood Index? that reflects the true cost of living increase in America and is updated and released twice a year. It reports the unadjusted actual cost and price fluctuation of the top 500 items on which Americans spend their after-tax dollars in the 50 largest cities in the United States, which I believe is extremely important in this day and age. So welcome to the show. Great. It's great to be here. Great catching up with you, man. Yeah. It's been a minute. Yeah, it has been. uh, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm your neighbor now. Yeah, I'm really proud of what you've done with your career. Oh, it's, thank you, uh, it's really amazing. I appreciate what it. you've built. Thank you, man. Very, very honored for you to say that. I mean, you've been around the block a lot, so for you. Well, to yeah, say just that. look at me. I, I mean, I look. <laughs> <laughs> I look like I've been around the block. So you went. You went to. You were. Well, you were uh, uh, raised in Maryland and New York. You're a Giants fan, even though you're living in Dallas. That's right. <laughs> yes. Who, who's Who's your second favorite team? Was it the AB? What? Uh, anyone but the Cowboys. It's ABC. ABC. That's right. Yes. <laughs> For me, my Chicago equivalent would be anybody but the Packers. Right. So that that would be my equivalent there. So uh, I, I'm I'm just curious. I mean, we're obviously going to catch up, you know, after the podcast here. But I'm just excited just to get together with you and and, and seeing you. I mean, over the years, I've seen you constantly on, on, on the news and, and you're providing your commentary on what's going on in the marketplace. So I'm just curious, what are you most excited about or fearful about in 2024? Well, what I'm most excited about is interest rates dropping. The Fed fund rate is going to get cut probably in April. And that's going to bring soon. All, all investments that are interest rate sensitive are going to do well. And that's going to include utilities which uh, seem really boring, but if you can get a 10% growth on the value of the asset plus a 3.5% income, anybody will be happy with a 13.5% total return. And then the other areas that I think are going to do well are going to be biotech stocks because they are heavy borrowers of money. And when interest rates come lower, the cost for them to borrow goes down and proportionally that helps them. And small cap growth stocks are going to do well in 2024. The political environment doesn't scare me at all. Interesting. Yeah. Um, although I don't think we're going to ever have a time where there's potentially such a, a change in the approach to the economy than if the Republicans take office again. Okay. Um, I think you're going to see a dramatic change from what Biden has you know, put in there with heavy regulations and increase in taxes than if Trump wins yep. and he's going to cut regulations again and yep. cut taxes and stimulate the economy that way. Do you honestly think Trump will make it? You know, they're talking about assassination since 2000. The day went down the escalator. It's been political, reputation, financial, you know, assassination attempts on his career and his life. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, do you think he's honestly going to make it in spite of them trying to remove him from the ballots, put him back on the ballots, and other states remove him from the ballots? It's, it's, a, it's a push for the two, everything. They're talking about kitchen sink and everything else. They're trying to get him... Yeah, I mean, here we are January 4th, and it's yet to be decided, but I believe the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of him being put on the ballots because he wasn't acute. He wasn't, you know, uh, uh, when I say accused, he wasn't sued about an insurrection. Uh, and I'm not this crazy Trump supporter. I'm mm-hmm. just looking mm-hmm. at it from a Republican Democrat standpoint. So yeah. it could be DeSantis, it could be Nikki Haley, yeah. uh, Vivek. I, I love. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm and, trying and, to get him on podcast in uh, February. Are you? Yeah, I'm trying to get him on here, man. Yeah, and he, he's he's hungry enough to do it. 
Dude, he's gonna he's gonna go, he's going in every podcast. That guy's hungry. Yeah. Well, you know, any of those people will be reducing taxes. Yeah. And that'll be a very different approach than what Biden has. You know, will Trump make it? I have no idea. Um, you know, yeah, I hope the, he doesn't. Um, yeah. To to some extent, because even my wife is tired of his his rhetoric and the whole thing, and a lot of that stuff isn't stuff that he brought on himself, but he reacts to it in a childish way. I mean, people say that's the way New Yorkers act. You're from New York. Would you validate that? Yeah, I think, I, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Like someone punches you, you come back to them with a torpedo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you don't stop. Right. Yeah, you're like he's constantly, you know, scorched earth, you know, even though he's beating you, he's going to remind you about him beating you a month ago or a month later after he takes you down. Um, when, when you're looking at, because uh, I've, I've often said this, and I don't care what's going on in the White House, I care most importantly what's going on in my house. So if people are worried about what's going on in their house, what's some of the most prudent financial things they can start doing here this year to get ready for those type of opportunities? Well, make sure you have income that's coming into your account. Always try to have some sort of income producing investment along with growth potential. Um, Cause you, you always want to look and see, you know, what kind of, what do you have that's liquid in order for you to live off of? Mm. And the cost of living increase, as you stated in your opening about the Chapwood Index, the cost of mm. living increase is far different than what the CPI is. Okay. So you have to take a look. And going back to 1983, prior to 1983, there were 1,700 items that were calculated and they were taken month by month on what their price increase was. And in 1983, the price increase got to about 13%. So um, under uh, Newt Gingrich, they decided to change the way they calculated the CPI, and they started manipulating it. So if you went back today and looked at the CPI using the old rules, okay. you'd find that your cost of living increase is about 700 basis points higher. Wow. Yes, it's, it's frightening. And that's why people are always falling behind. And in this, I also believe, I would love to do a 60 Minutes segment mm -hmm. on this, mm -hmm. because people don't realize that when you have a... Um, cost of living increase that is far less than what you're making. People follow all the rules. They, they pay their taxes, they pay insurance, they, they mm -hmm. you know, do everything they're supposed to do, but they fall further and further behind. So a lot of people in the inner cities, and these people are living off of fixed incomes, mm -hmm. and these are middle income and lower income people. Mm -hmm. And every single or year- Or they have professions and careers, it's not going to have a big jump. Right, you're getting there's so much money you can only pay certain that somebody that works that type of job. Well, they're getting paid. Their increases are based on the CPI, and the CPI is bogus. So they're losing about 700 basis points a, a year. year. You, you only need five years, then you're 35 percent behind. No wonder there's a lot of crime yeah. and a lot of unhappiness in the inner cities. Yeah. So so yeah, and because if you don't, if you're not able to un generate yourself, you got to take it from somebody else. You got to steal. You got you got to do. You cut corners to. To be able to keep up. Yeah, I always tell people they need to become revenue producers. And if you're a revenue producer, then you're going to be able to be paid based on your productivity, mm -hmm. not a thumbs up or thumbs down from somebody uh, who's in management. Can you give us some ideas? I mean, you, you've, you've obviously seen a lot of people do this. What are some of the easiest revenue producing ways? If they have a current job right now in 2024, in addition to that, having a side hustle perhaps with some of the revenue things they can do. Well, they could join your organization. Okay, um, for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, anything you can do in addition to whatever it is that you're making okay. um, is, it will be helpful because the system is set up for you to fail right now. Got if it. you are a middle income, lower income person, the one percenters, they get paid based on their productivity. So if you're producing and you're doing very well, then, mm -hmm. then you're going to get paid more. Right. And if you're not, then you've taken the risk and you're going to get paid less. So what do the 80 percenters get paid on? The one percenters? The 80 percenters, the rest of everybody else. They get paid based on a thumbs up or thumbs down on a salary that somebody pays them. Got it. So in other words, the risk that the one percenters are willing to pay to, to take, that's why they get paid in the top one percent of America, because they're willing to take the biggest risk. That's right. They, take, they risk their money, their time, their energy, their reputation mm -hmm. in order to have the biggest financial reward possible, because they could lose it. And if they, they win, though... <laughs> they get the benefits of... That's right. And you always hear about the, the winners, and you don't hear about the losers. You hear yeah. about like a guy like Mark Cuban, mm -hmm. um, who, who took a big risk and won, yeah. but there's a thousand Mark Cubans out there yeah. that didn't win. Yep. Um, but you don't hear about them. You only hear about the winners, and then you know, people make excuses as to you know, why those people succeeded. Uh, Jordan, can you show my screen here right quick? But 
uh, I want to show everybody here. This is the show that you and I were on. Kind of a little bit of flashback, huh? <laughs> this is a flashback to uh, 2010. Uh, we were the coaches representing. It was it was Miami, New York, Minnesota, Denver, Syracuse. Yep, Syracuse. Yeah. And that's when we met uh, Doctor uh, 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 Boyce Watkins. Yes, Boyce Watkins. Right? And, and uh, he's, he's he's been very outspoken. He's been very outspoken for quite some time. But uh, that's when I got to meet you. I, and we we actually worked a, a client together uh, because uh, you know I'm I'm more heavy insurance based in in, in basic fundamentals of one on one personal finance, but once that client got a little bit more sophisticated when it came to investments, that when, that's when they brought you in. Now, you've worked with, and then in that tour, and when we launched the show in New York, first time I've been in New York in the Meat District where we, we did the, the show launch. That's right. And uh, you introduced me to uh, Pablo Torre, who worked for uh, Sports Illustrated, yep. Filipino. Yes. And then uh, you're also working together. Well, you work with a lot of professional athletes, though. Yes. Uh, I think you were uh, working together with Torrey Hunter. Yes. You're talking with Torrey Hunter. You introduced me to Winfred Tubbs, who played for the 49ers. Right. So talk to us. What, what's the difference between what wealthy people do with their money to continue to gain wealth versus somebody that just make, might, might make a lot of money? Well, what I do with professional athletes is I try to teach them how when, they ret- when they're done playing, that's how they're going to live off of just that money. But what typically happens with professional athletes is that they will put about 90% of their money where they shouldn't have more than 10% of their money. Mm. They'll put it in private equity and venture and real estate. And they shouldn't do that till they have $3 million put away after taxes. After taxes. Right. And yeah. a lot of professional athletes you know, handle it completely the wrong way. They're putting Mm -hmm. 90% of their money where they shouldn't have any money until they have $3 million put away. And so I've put together a book called Never Go Broke, an investment guide for professional athletes. Um, Never Go Broke, love it. Yeah, so with Pablo Torre, we... I actually approached Sports Illustrated um, when Winford Tubbs approached me one day and showed me a statement on an investment that he had called the Champions Fund. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I said, well, this doesn't look like a bad investment. Why do you have it? And he made a comment. He said, we all have it. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, half the NFL is in this investment. And I thought, well, that's wrong. I mean, everybody has different dreams and goals and, and wants and needs. All because you're a professional athlete doesn't mean you have the same investment goals. Is it because of the NFLPA? The, the union? No, no, it was just because it was Harris Barton, uh, uh, Ronnie Lott, Joe Montana. The they ran it wow. and, okay. and they got everybody into this. Mm, okay. And that was the Champions Fund. And it was a. a it was Interesting. A, so a lot of professional athletes end up in the financial services industry. Those, those names you just mentioned are in the. Or were they industry, or they were just investors? They were just investors. Oh, got it, got it. But but they were they they ran the fund, so oh, got so it. they were investors in the fund and they ran the fund. Got it. And it was uh, an entry uh, to venture capital investing. Gotcha. So so you had so what what you have then is all of these people doing the same thing. Okay. And I thought, well, that's just strange mm-hmm. and very strange. So I called up Sports Illustrated, uh, a guy named Richard Zemat who was the managing editor, and I said, we've got to do this story. And he didn't call me back after three calls, and it really bothers me when people don't call me back. Uh, so anybody out there who's watching, if I call you, please call me back. <laughs> um, but what I, what I said was, if you do this story, you'll increase circulation 4.2% that month. And he called me back from Beijing. He was at the Beijing Olympics okay. just to correct me that Sports Illustrated came out weekly. But I convinced him at that time to assign somebody, and he assigned Pablo Torre, who's now a very famous sure. uh, guy, uh, to the story. And we went to a meeting uh, with a, a guy named Nate Robinson, who's a basketball player. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. we sat there um, in the lobby of a hotel, and we told Nate that his agent had been stealing from him mm. and bought a house and bought a car. And Nate's response, along with his father, uh, his father was sitting there. His neat response was, well, is it a nice house? Not that he was upset that he had the money wow. stolen, but he wanted to know if he bought a nice house. Wow. So at that point, Pablo decided this was a story we needed to do. And it became the most popular downloaded story in the history of Sports Illustrated. Really? Yeah. So then people from ESPN decided to turn it into one of the broke or into a 30 for 30 mm, called Broke. That's right. And that's how we got that story going. Well, it's, it's, it's awesome. I'm thinking you just mentioned they should until they have you said three million bucks, and then they can put that into venture, venture. and private equity and real estate. So the, I, I just uh, can you look at the, my screen here, Jordan? So the average NFL salary here um, 
is eight hundred sixty thousand dollars a year. What's the reality with this money? Because they're paid as employees. There's yeah, eight hundred sixty thousand agent fees, taxes. They get about forty percent of that, <laughs> and that doesn't include the family plan, and the family the plan. Entourage, right? Right. So you're talking about forty percent of that. So they're really bringing home three forty four. So divide that by twelve months is twenty thousand dollars a month. That's nothing. Yeah, I have one one player for the Saints. Um, I just looked at his stuff this morning, and he's only spending seventeen percent of what he brings home, which is very very good. Um, so and he's and he's and he's tucking that away into just, in, just into concern. an investment account. Oh, okay, investment account. Got right, it. but he's spending seventeen percent of what he brings home. Ideally, what should if you're looking at the totality of their entire career, how much should they have had? Talked away from their entire body of work from just salary in an ideal world? Well, I would say about 75% of it. Tucked away. They should. Wow. Yeah, because the pain they feel today for not spending mm -hmm. that money yeah. pales in comparison to the pain they're going to feel years later mm -hmm. when they don't have it. And I've seen people go through their careers and not follow good advice mm -hmm. and then sit there and wonder, you know, when their 14 year old daughter mm -hmm. wants a new bicycle mm -hmm. and they're like, oh my goodness, I can't do it. And the pain that they feel and the embarrassment that they feel is unbelievable. I, I heard in the NFL, they usually just get paid during the season, which is about 17, 18 weeks. Correct. Right. Now they can extend it so they yeah. get paid over the whole time period. Yeah. For, they, throughout the year. Right. They can negotiate yeah. it to be paid that way. Because what I was hearing is a lot of the players were running out of money if they only got paid for 17, 18 weeks. So whatever they brought in, they'd spend out. Right. And they, they couldn't even come to OTAs because <laughs> they were broke. Yeah. Yeah. There, and there's, there's a group of people <clears throat> in Maryland, <clears throat> and there's, there's actually a number of people around the country that will loan money. Yeah. Uh, there's one pitcher who pitched for the Yankees who needed to borrow uh, half a million dollars during the offseason mm -hmm. every single year and then pay back at 17%. Um, I mean, it's just really poor money management. It's like going to the car title, car title or pay, payday loans to get an advance in your, yes. your, your paychecks. Yeah. In this case, it's just a different level. Right, and these, lo these people who make the loans will do it because they have a guarantee from MLB, so the MLB will pay them. Gotcha. They'll back their wages or their garnish right, wages exactly. to, to, pay, to pay back a loan. Yeah. Um, what's your take now on this, on this, uh, this season, this new era of NIL deals where college players, I mean, uh, Archie Manning, the, your alma mater, uh, mm -hmm. Texas, He's, got, he's a backup quarterback, too. He's getting paid more money in NIL. He's like $3, 4000000 million a year uh, because he's a Manning. And Brock Purdy, who's Mr. Irrelevant, who's potentially the MVP of the league, yep. is getting paid, you know, $860,000, yeah. $70,000. I mean, there's such a sea change happening right now with college sports. I mean, I'm not sure exactly where the NIL money is coming from because you don't see Arch Manning on any ads. Um, he's really just getting paid money to go to school there. Yeah. Um, but I also know that there's a group of people in Houston who claim to be the biggest NIL backers. And I looked at their clients and their average client gets a thousand dollars a year. So they have 80 clients. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them are from Texas A&M, but you know, there's a golfer, there's a backup, uh, water polo person mm -hmm. and, and they get paid a thousand dollars a year. So the NIL money is really isolated in very high, you know, high desirable people. Yep. Um, you know, Caleb Williams, yep. um, he's getting paid quite a bit of money. Yeah. Four or $5 million a year. Shadur, San, uh, Shadur Sanders, Dion's uh, son, he's getting paid, you know, four or $5 million a year to be a quarterback in Colorado. So that's more money then a rookie quarterback will be number one overall. Yeah. So, and a lot of these guys will say, you know, I don't need to go to, to the pros. I'm changing my life right now. And so what, what I see NIL money, that, which by the way, I'm kind of glad these college players are getting paid in, in my end because they're generating a lot of revenue for what, a scholarship back in the day? Uh, and maybe under the table they're getting paid and it was illegal. And hey, there, there, was one, <laughs> there was one guy when I was at University of Texas and this was a, a running back um, and we were there for the summer and I picked him up and he said, hey, let's go down here to this building. Mm -hmm. And um, he, I said, what are we doing here? And he says, well, this is where my internship is. And I said, where's your internship? He goes, this law firm. He went up, came down with an envelope of money. And I said, what do you do? He goes, I just pick up money. <laughs> it's internship. Yeah. So it's, a lot, it's, a lot of, uh, it's like leg, it's like leg day. Leg day and back day to pick up the envelope, a heavy, heavy envelope. Uh, when, when you're looking at these guys, you know, there's also, I see the, the smaller schools. 
if everybody's going to the bigger schools because they got the bigger NIL contracts or NIL deals to get paid to go there, I, th I, th I think there's a disparity happening with the smaller schools' inability to recruit because they might not have that money in, in, in lower schools. What, what's your thoughts on? Uh, oh, without question, yeah. there's there's a huge, uh, you know, separation between the bigger schools and the smaller schools, just like there is with uh, the SEC and the Big 12 and the Big 10. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you those those groups are going to get bigger and then the Division One schools, are, you know, a lot of them are going to get smaller. Yeah. So there, there's just, we're going to look back and realize that this was a real big shuffle in college sports. So you, you, you have a lot of advice for professional athletes. But yes. these amateur athletes, I would say they're professional because they're bringing money to as well. At the amateur ranks, in the college ranks, so it, would you have any advice for any college athlete listening to this right now? Say, hey, listen, I got, I signed a one, two, three million dollar NIL to play basketball or football or whatever. Any advice you would give them on that? Well, I obviously it would be to save their money and invest their money and teach them about the rule of 72. Mm -hmm. If you take the number 72 and divide right. it by a rate of return, that's how many years it'll take to double your money. So if you took 72 and if you grew your money at 10%, mm -hmm. that $1 million would be $2 million in 7.2 years and would be $4 million in 14.4 years. So at the age of, let's say, 34, mm -hmm. they would have $4 million put away. Yeah. And I would try to teach them that. Um, and, you know, you just got to make sure that the communication is effective. If people don't get and understand it, it's not their fault. This is something that I've always believed, Matt, is that the communication has to be crafted in a way for it to appeal to somebody. It's just like advertising. If somebody doesn't buy your product, it's not their fault that they didn't buy your product. It's your fault for not crafting the message in a way where they wanted to hear it. Right. So... I believe that, you know, that's one of the challenges I have with everybody, not just professional athletes, but everybody needs to learn exactly how um, to manage money and, and, and how money works and, and how it grows. So if you grew your money at 15% a year, mm -hmm. which is not realistic, but if you were, your money would double every 4.8 years. So, you know, then in 9.6 years, your million dollars is $4 million. And uh, then you tack on top of that, the cost of living increase being so much greater than what people believe it is. When you run those numbers, then you're really, you know, getting to somebody. But but the message has to be crafted in a way where people understand. Yeah. And by the way, back to your uh, your thoughts from a few minutes ago uh, with players being lent money for 17%. So the rule 7-2 in that instance works against the player because they're borrowing. Oh, yeah. Without question. And, um, you know, that particular player... Uh, he was making um, something like twelve million a year, and he still needed to borrow five hundred thousand. Yeah, wow, yeah. It, it's so easy to spend money. It's, it's so oh. it's so it'll fly up. It's so hard to make it. You know, it's like difficult to make it. So, speaking of that, uh, you know, uh, I'm just curious, tell everybody um, how you started your career in in in, in the brokerage. I, I think your, your one of your, your parents was. Uh, was a regulator for the SEC? Yeah, my father okay. Okay. was the head of enforcement at the SEC, yeah. and he went on to a great career being a 40s Act attorney, and he um, gave me a suggestion to interview with Morgan Stanley, and I interviewed with them, and I'll never forget after I interviewed with them, I said I got the job, and his great motivation was, well, I don't know if you're ever going to be any good at it. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, what what kind of? So he, act, he encouraged you to do it, and then he kind of gave you that. Yeah, was that a, was that because you know there's positive thinking and then there's negative thinking. You know, Coach uh, Coach Knight of Indiana was a good negative thinking type coach. Where yeah, well, the, I think my father at that point was kind of being a little negative. Um, but to he inspire said, you or negative to be down on you? To, I think he was being down on me. Mm. I think he was, but that was all the motivation I needed. So after my first year. At Morgan Stanley, I had become the number one producer in the office, and it was just a matter of getting in and cold calling and you know calling people up and how many dials a day? Oh, I would do at least a hundred cold calls a day. Damn, at least because we had something that was called a cherry chart, and you would circle a cherry uh -huh. every time you made a call, and we always went through those. But yeah. but that was hard work. And we didn't have emails back then. We yeah. didn't have cell phones. Self, you just call media. people. Yeah. And, um, and, but you definitely get out what you put into this world. Mm -hmm. And I just always said I was working for my unborn children. And 
Uh, I didn't realize I was working for my wife to to easily buy stuff from Amazon. Um, but 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 if you're watching, that's what you were doing. That's what I was doing. I was working so you could buy crap from Amazon. Yeah, one click orders. You know, one click orders. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's although awesome. although I'm kind of guilty of it as well. <laughs> Naturally, so 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 you evolved in Morgan Stanley. How did you know you're ready to start your own deal? Well, I left Morgan Stanley and went to Bank of America. And when I went to B of A, it was a disaster. Everything they said that they had set up. Was this before they bought uh, Merrill Lynch? This was before Merrill Lynch, okay. yeah. Yep. Um, when they had something called the, the Montgomery Securities Platform, which was a high net worth platform, and I went over there, and they said they had all this stuff set up ready uh, to manage money, mm -hmm. and they weren't. So within uh, about 11 months, I left there and went off and started my own company. And um, Chapwood Investments is a boutique wealth management firm. And we try to focus on high net worth individuals, although we will take anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't ever want somebody to feel like they're not entitled to, you know, professional help yeah. if they don't have a lot oh, of money. interesting, good. Yeah. Is there like, is there like a, so the typical, you know, Bank of America, uh, uh, at, you know, Chase private wealth manager, they're, they're, they're at 250. Anything less than 250, they don't get paid. Is there like a firm minimum that you have at Chapwood? No. Really? Yeah, we don't have any minimums. I don't. Well, I don't ever want somebody to feel less because they don't have enough money. Okay. It's just an empathetical thing. Okay. Um, so I take care of people who have fifty thousand um, dollars, and I take I a lot of time. That. With man, them. we need to talk, man. We need to talk for sure. Yeah, because there's definitely a need out there for everybody. And and the way that things are set up today, you can do just as good a job for somebody who has 50,000 or 100,000 uh -huh. than if they have a million dollars. Yeah. People in our industry always want people with more money because we get paid a percentage of what yeah. we're managing. Sure. But, you know, I have enough time. And, and you know, there's the the, you know, trade talk here. You know, there's a conversation in the the financial services industry where you people either just charge a flat fee or in the insurance world they charge a commission. Um, and they, one is more noble than the other. I mean, what, what, what do you prefer? Do you, do, there's a situation where commissions are more appropriate than fee or fees more appropriate than commission. Well, commissions are pretty much dead these days. Um, it's all management fees and you charge a percentage of the assets that you manage. Now we don't charge on money market. We don't charge a uh, full fare on corporate bonds or municipal bonds or government bonds. Cause mm -hmm. I don't think there's any reason to, cause all you do is they just sit there. There's no evaluation that really needs to take place. Mm -hmm. um, you usually hold them to maturity or if interest rates rise, mm -hmm. uh, they go down in value. You could sell them for tax loss purposes or if interest rates uh, go down, they might go up and you can sell them at profits. But we don't charge on money market and corporate bonds or, or as I said, munis or uh, mm -hmm. government bonds. So we're, we, we ch end up charging a blended rate about 75 basis points. Mm -hmm. And we think that's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, because, you know, when I got involved in the financial services industry, I got my Series 6, 63, and 26, and the, the brokerage I was with, the broker-dealer I was with, is more of like an insurance, you know, like a variable universal life, and variable annuity type of shop, too, mm -hmm. as well. And we do, you know, uh, mutual funds uh, as well. But I've since gravitated, since 01, 02, I just gravitated more towards the insurance side of things because my clientele is multicultural, middle-income demographic and they didn't really understand the ups and downs of the market and they're thinking that you know, they lost a 10 percent return they think the financial advisor made off with it <laughs> you know <there's> those <laughs> simple, simple basic things like that right so i said, I said it's good for me for individuals to own, own securities but i don't know if i want to do it as a business owner for the demographic that i was working so the, so is, is there times where you see life insurance you we were just talking earlier about life insurance being part of the financial services ecosystem when you're helping the client out. Mm -hmm. When does is, when is insurance come into the conversation with your clients? I've always avoided the insurance conversation because I'm not insurance licensed. Um, that's, that's starting to change because I'm starting to understand uh, where it does fit in. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'll be recommending people to you mm, um, okay. and to Thank the you. people that work for you. Yeah. Um, but it... I'm doing more of a kind of a family office approach where I'm talking oh, to people about their estates and their wills right. and, and then insurance comes into play. And I normally just refer that business out to people and hoping that they then refer 
business back to For me. sure, yeah. There, there's a situation we had a client who was a massive real estate investor. He had about $50 million of commercial real estate. Anyway, make a long story short, you know, as, you know as well as I do, and everybody may not know, but there's an estate tax out there. So his money is well above the estate tax crowd, even with the husband and wife taking advantage of it. So there was an exposure of $21, $22 million of, of estate tax. And if the kids were to inherit the property, uh, they'd have to pay the $21 million in estate tax. Mm-hmm. You know, so they have to have no other liquid cash, by the way, outside of a you know, some, you know, few million dollars here in, 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 in her savings and investments. And they had $2 million that was sitting in a money market account there for like a decade of not doing anything. So we ended up repositioning a $2 million into another financial pocket, which is the life insurance policy, which is funding an irrevocable life insurance trust. If something happened to mom and dad, sure, the $21 million would still be triggered in terms of estate tax. But in this instance, though, the children will not have to fire sale the properties in order to pay the estate tax. Mm-hmm. So they're able to keep the properties intact because the $21 million here in the trust would then pay the, would pay the estate tax. So the client didn't have to dig deeper into his pocket. All he had to do is just move money from here, left pocket to the right pocket, fund it into the trust. So that's a insurance strategy that we've helped with with a lot of uh, uh, clients is a, is a risk mitigation right. type of tool. Yeah, and that's how I see it. I mean, and, and I have... You know, personally, I have term insurance um, where I pay fifteen hundred dollars a month. Wow! Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know how I do that, <laughs> but 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 somehow my wife, yeah. you know, in between Amazon packages, is writing a <laughs> check. Pay the premium. Is, is paying the premium. <laughs> um, yeah. But I I just have always it's been like toxic to me insurance, but but that has changed now. What what caused oh. it to change? Um, I have this young uh, partner named Jordan who came from... My son's from, name, Jordan. Oh. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So he, he came from uh, an insurance background and has been teaching me a little bit more about it. And uh, it always got me was uh, whole life and universal life and term. And I just didn't really take the time to learn it. Sort of like air conditioning to me. If somebody, if my air conditioning breaks, someone comes out and says it's going to be a thousand dollars. I say, no, 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 you're ripping me off. And I have no idea what is going on with the, yeah. with the, ins- with the air conditioning. Yeah. I just, you know, right away say, no, no, no. And with insurance, I've always been that way, mm. but I'm starting to change. I'm starting to grow up. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Have, have your clients, have your clients, have your professional athletes, because one of the, one of the policies that my wife has sold a lot of is um, index universe life policies because it has living benefits. So if any of the, her, and my wife went to University of Pitt, so a lot of clients are, are, are pro athletes, they're, you know, basketball, a lot of them are basketball and, and football, but if you, in case they get hurt, um, or you have a client that suffers a heart attack, stroke, or cancer, people often think that the only way to get money from the policy is if you die. When the, with a living benefit policy, if you survive, uh, you know, an injury on the field and you can't play anymore, or, or you have a heart attack and you need help around the house to rehab, or you have a heart attack, stroke, or cancer, and you survive, the death benefit is paid while you're alive. So it's called I didn't a, know that. Yeah, it's called a living benefit. Okay. Yeah. So my, my, the guy that built my website, he was 38 years old, you know, uh, Dustin. You know, he, he built my website, and uh, he's reading my stuff. He's like, oh, I think I need to get a policy. He's from Trinidad. His wife's from the south side of Chicago. They got four kids. Anyway, for like 80 bucks a month, he gets a policy. 18 months later, at 38 years old, brother, he has a stroke. Survives, though, thank God. But the life insurance policy, they started with 80 bucks a month, paid him a multiple six-figure tax-free check, that living benefit check, and you can, hey, health insurance takes care of health insurance policy, but if you need to take this uh, multiple six-figure check to maybe get a new car or ref, you know, uh, refit the house to have a wheelchair through it, right. knock yourself out. You know, those, well, you, I bet you get your website done for free now. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's one of our brokers. He's one of our insurance brokers at our, at our, at our office in Chicago. Fantastic. So he's got a great story of how he's selling life insurance that way. I never even heard about that. I, d- I just know that one of the big things that we talk about is uh, uh, old age care. Correct. Long-term care. So Long-term my, care. My, I just moved my parents from Chicago. I bought this policy from 20 years ago, paying an ass to pay it, but I was paying 3000 4000 a year for their long-term care policy. I was like, man, this kept increasing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and I was still paying it. Well, my dad kept falling at the last stairs in Chicago, you know, it's like New York, right? The last stairs, you know, very vertical buildings. Mm-hmm. Last stair, he'd take a dump and he'd fall and he couldn't get up. And my mom called me three times from Chicago. Like, mom, that's not happening anymore. I, I can't do it. You're FaceTiming me from Chicago. I'm in Dallas. What do you want me to do? So I called my cop buddies to go do a wellness check and, you know, pick him back up and get him back on his feet. So you're moving to Dallas. So I moved them out here. They're now in not, not, they're not in a nursing home, but they're in a retirement community. You know, those, those uh, right. you know, they got, you know, 
bells and whistles. They got food. They got uh, activities. My mom looks at the uh, the calendar every day of all the activities being done that day. She goes, oh, my gosh, Machu, it's like a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> so she's living in this community, which I believe is going to be a future real estate opportunity because a lot of these communities don't exist today. Yep. And all the ones around Dallas we're looking at, they're like, we're selling out. We're selling up. People are they're selling their homes and yep. going to these communities because they can't manage these big homes that they bought in Dallas. They'd rather sell it to a younger couple. Yep. So they go into these communities, but there's just not That's enough. That's what my in-laws did. Right. Yeah, and my, my mother-in-law has Parkinson's. Mm. And um, and my father-in-law, it's amazing how well he's taking care of her. I never yeah. thought he'd be that caring. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't mean that, that bad, Jim, but I never thought you would be. Um, we'll clip that out and make sure we send it to him. <laughs> but but their, 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 their insurance... They did not have insurance for long-term care. Yeah. And always surprised me that the amount of money that you put into long-term care yeah. is really what you get back. It's almost like a savings account mm -hmm. versus insurance yep. because you pay back, you get back what you put in yeah. and not more than that. Well, here's the thing with this, this long-term care policy. We put four, three, four, it went to $5,000 a year in premiums, painted but painted. But now I'm with my dad out here. Now we, we, start, we started the, the benefits for three years now that... Now they're paying five thousand a month for my folks to stay there for the next three years. When I was paying five thousand a year, so what a great trade-off! Well, that's that is. You know? So they don't have to go into their IRAs, right, you know, or four hundred one k's to trigger more uh, taxable, taxes, right? yeah, taxable withdrawals, right? So now they they they're living there. So we have we have three years of okay. What are we going to do in, in the meantime? And, uh, and we're, obviously, if, 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 once the policy runs out, we can still keep paying it. But but at least they don't have to. Dig deeper into their pockets. We don't have to dig deeper into their pockets because of the long-term care, mm -hmm. old age type of policy. Yeah, that's the thing that comes up quite a bit. Interesting. Um, and you know, disability insurance. Usually, the athletes have that covered by their agents. Um, but I've got to I got to put a call out to a lot of them and make sure of that because yeah. I shouldn't assume that they're doing it or that it's up, you know, yeah. up to speed. Right, exactly. Um, speaking of athletes and investments, um, I'm sure you're 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 privy to some you know, without naming names, but what's some? Because when I was in the military, I learned from more of the horror stories of what not to do. Guys blowing themselves up, mm -hmm. or when we we're in deployment and we we're going to like the you know Bangkok, Thailand, or Phuket, Thailand. Here, here's what happens when you don't have protected, you know, whatever case may be. Right, guys coming back to the ship, and they got pictures of all this you know, venereal disease. It was disgusting. So that just made me. They showed they, you pictures of oh, the yeah. venereal oh, diseases, for sure. and it shocked me into discipline. <laughs> oh <laughs> my I don't, goodness! I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to have that. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, so I learned. From, I learned that way. Okay. So and many of our viewers learned that way. They learned from the horror stories versus the opportunities. Right. So give us some financial horror stories of what people didn't do right and how they ended up. You have any of those? Well, I mean, there's there's so many horror stories. <laughs> to pull I mean, from. it's it's a matter of people putting money into an investment where um, one one person put a hundred and seventy five thousand dollars into a t shirt company, and it was his high school friend, and then his friend called him and said, "Look, if you don't put another hundred thousand in, your original hundred and seventy five thousand is gone." Mm. So he put another hundred thousand in. So now he has two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars into this t shirt company. And he got another call about a year later saying you need to put another hundred in or it's going to go away. So he has three hundred and seventy five thousand, and then the whole project went away. Wow. Um, and and he had no say other than he just wow. gave money. So he lost three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in a t shirt company. What was he expecting back? What was he expecting? Well, that's the thing that a lot of these guys don't really analyze what their ownership value is. Yeah. So when he put one hundred seventy five thousand in. Um, let's just say he got 10%. That means this person valued the company at 1.7 million and he hadn't even sold a t-shirt yet. So, I mean, how do you value a company that you didn't sell a t-shirt mm -hmm. and, you know, at, at 1.7 million, yep. it, it just doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. So Achoo. that's, that's one of them. Then there's a, a famous story with Tory Hunter. He has no problem with me telling this where there was a, uh, there was this company that made plastic where you could take your furniture and if you were in a flood prone area, mm -hmm. you could put your furniture into this plastic and it would blow it up. And if the flood came, your furniture would be protected. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, he put some money into that. All right. Uh, but there's always different ideas. I mean, there's a lot of people who are putting money in uh, cannabis right now. And, sure. and yeah. you know, if you, 
aren't careful, you can end up getting really messed around mm. um, because there's only going to be big companies that are going to do well on cannabis. And a lot of these small farmers are not going to do well. Uh, but, but there's always people looking for shortcuts. And then the restaurant business is a terrible business. Uh, but uh, Kevin Durant put money into a restaurant called Durant's in Oklahoma City, and he didn't get any ownership in it at wow, all. Wow, they're just licensing his name? Well, the guy who did it was mm. his personal chef and didn't give him any ownership. Wow. Um, so, so there's just a lot of you know, T's that aren't crossed and I's that aren't dotted. Right. Uh, and a lot of people don't know the right questions to ask. Right, and that's why they, got, they go to guys like you to, to to analyze those deals and yeah to make sure they're making prudent, pragmatic decisions. That's that's why I always I want to have a website that says notsofast dot com, <laughs> and and send me your thing before you do it. Not so fast. Uh, we got that on GoDaddy. Let's make sure we look for it and uh, make sure we buy the domain right now. We can sell it back to Ed, <laughs> to Ed here in a minute. Yeah, but notsofast dot com um, because there's just too many people. Also, there's a lot of times where athletes get. Uh, taken advantage of because of who they are. So let's say somebody needed to redo the uh, their driveway, mm -hmm. and somebody pulls up and says, "Oh my goodness, it's uh, Deion Sanders." Yeah. Well, he's going to get a different price than yeah. you and I might get. The, the, the celebrity tax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Right. Too bad, is it? Um, so when 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 you're looking at um, when you, when you're looking at uh, 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 the, the investments uh, area side of things, uh, you mentioned the uh, the interest rates. Dropping, um, in your opinion, in your, in your viewpoint, how do you see that affecting the real estate market? How do you see that in housing here? And in, in, you know, the Dallas Fort Worth area, and we just bought in, in Frisco, but we're not seeing any drop in, in real estate. But we do see a tightening of who can actually afford it. Right. So, what, what do you for, forecast? You know, do you have any thoughts on the housing market? Yeah. Well, the housing market's going to have kind of a, a, a pull and tug kind of situation because you're going to have lower interest rates that are going to stimulate more demand, which is sure. already happening. So people say, oh, I can buy that now because it's, it's right, Which is bottom. then going to push the prices higher because if there's a big demand and there's not a lot of uh, supply, the prices are going to go higher. So most likely you're going to see prices go higher on real estate as interest rates drop. And you're already starting to see that now, uh, starting to see that tighten up. Now, when it comes to commercial real estate, which is a huge issue um, about 25% of the notes on commercial real estate are coming due in the next 18 months. So that means that they're going to have to refinance at higher rates. Because the, 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 the 10 or 15 year terms, the, the, the commercial notes? Well, it, it depends. You know, each one's yeah. going to be different. Yeah. But about 25% are coming due in the next wow. 18 months. Wow. So because you're financed at a lower rate. That's right. Much lower rate than we're yes. finding today. And now they're going to have to refinance at a much higher rate. And that's going to make it so the rents that they charge are going to go up quite a bit. And that's going to make it even more unaffordable. For businesses? Yes. Because they got to pay the higher. They got to pay right. higher. So the ones that are locked in are locked in until the lease is done. That's right. But if they want to stay there. Yep. I'm in the process of renegotiating for my lease right now. Uh, and um, we're at, I don't even know what the number is, but I know that they're asking for 10% more to start and we're trying to get them to become 10% less. So we have a 20% delta. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I don't know if we're going to win or not. Uh, wow. So you might have to potentially even move your... your yeah, we'll probably stay. Yeah. I don't want them to see this, but we'll, gotcha. we'll stay regardless. Gotcha. Um, you know, you've always been a guy that has uh, been dependable. Every time I've called you, you've always been available. You've responded to me in a timely manner. It's not been always with the way with me because i I got 100 text messages at the time. But... Uh, you've always been very good at getting back with, with people because you live what you just talked. If you don't get back, then it annoys because you put out to the world, I get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, so how have you grown your business? How you become, I think, a very attractive characteristic about you is your ability to be referable, to, to get referrals, to be mm -hmm. the guy in this industry that, that does this type of stuff. Right. Well, how would you guide somebody who's out there starting a business or even in our industry to become more referable? Um, to be become an educator. People don't want to be sold. People want to be taught. And when you increase your brain, that's really attractive to people. And if you help people learn, 
they're going to always remember you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I always try, no matter who they are, I try to teach people, even if they're very wealthy, the amount of wealth someone has doesn't necessarily coincide with how much knowledge they have about investing. And you have to become the smartest person out there. And what I love, I have ADD and I love it. I could take some pill to take care of it, but, yeah. but I love the idea of always having something new to think about. Um, and there's always something happening in the world that you could ask me about any place in the world right now mm -hmm. and I'll know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people I think respect that I yeah. have that knowledge. Yeah. Um, and what's happening with interest rates, what's happening with the world economy, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's happening with shipping today mm -hmm. uh, because of the war in uh, the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me is, you know, probably one of the things that I think is the reason I get referrals from people. Is because I love to educate people, and before someone because becomes you're a client, always know. Yeah, 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 and yeah. but before somebody becomes a client, I try to teach them as much so they know how to evaluate and judge a financial advisor, because it can't be just oh you work at Morgan Stanley so you must be a good person. I know a lot of people at Morgan Stanley who aren't great people mm. who don't know the industry, mm. and and here comes one of the the biggest things is that people in my industry talk about managing risk. But most people don't know how to even measure risk, let alone manage it. <laughs> yeah. So how can yeah. you manage risk if you don't even know how to measure it? Right. And so I've taken on these calculators we've created in a, on our site called Investment Forensics. And in Investment Forensics, we have the ability to analyze portfolios and, and talk about exactly how to manage and measure risk. And we have a term called variance drag phantom tax, VDPT. And the more variance you have on a portfolio, the greater the drag on the returns. And most people at a Morgan Stanley or a UBS or a Merrill Lynch don't have any idea how to measure risk, but yeah. we do. Because it, it, that, that drag would take away from the return. Is That's what right. You're saying. Right. The more variance, the more volatility, the greater the drag on the compounded returns. Right. And it's phantom because no one talks about it. Mm -hmm. And tax, the word tax is something that jumps out at people. And it's taxing. It's it's unnecessary yep. if people understand how to manage money. Back, it's back to inflation. That's another version of tax. Tax for the, yeah, uh, the average it, Joe. It really is. You know, It's investment inflation. 80% uh, of all the money printed in the history of the United States of America has been printed in the last three, four years. I was talking to a chief investment um, officer of an insurance company, and I said, well, I, same relative question, what are you excited most about in, 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 in this year ahead? And he was, in his opinion, was like, there's just too much money in the marketplace today. There's just too much money out there. Um, and I was wondering, I wanted to bounce that off of you. Is there too much money in, still in the marketplace today? The stimuluses and, and the, mm -hmm. the, the quantitative easing that was going on, is there too much money in the marketplace where inflation still hasn't slowed that down or sucked that money back out so therefore you know, our money's worth something again? Yeah, well, if you create more of anything, the value of it goes down, just like salt and sugar. Mm -hmm. There's so much salt and sugar in the world that there's really, you know, if you just spill a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar, nobody really cares, okay? Um, so if you print more dollars, the value of what you have goes down. So there's so much printing of money that it becomes inflationary and the value of what you have buys less. Mm -hmm. And I heard a statistic that about 50% of what we use in this country comes from outside the United States. I'm not sure if that's actually correct, okay. but I'm going to say it. Yeah. Um, but so if you think about that, that the value of the dollar has gone down. So that means the value of what we have has, um, has gone higher. And so so, you know, we could take these microphones. Yeah. I'm sure some part of these microphones came from outside the United States mm -hmm. and the value, the price for those went higher and that's inflationary pressures. So there was quite a bit of money out there and you yeah. just have to look at M2, which is a money supply. And if you look at M2, um, it's come down quite a bit, but it's still very, very high. And there's mm -hmm. a direct relationship between M2, which is money supply yeah. and inflation. Yeah. In, in the country right now, we're, we're topping $33, $34 trillion in, in, in national debt. And, and since 2016, we've, we've been adding, you know, we've added from, we're at $15, $16 trillion in debt. We've basically doubled our national debt in the last, you know, going on 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so question for the person that's listening to this. Why should they care about the national debt? Because it's like, well, I'm paying it. 
Why should they care? Because also the interest on what we're paying on a national debt is nearing a trillion dollars a year. Yeah. Which is more than what we're spending on defense. Yeah. But we're paying in, in interest. So, so those two questions. Well, if you take 30, it's actually top 34 trillion yesterday. Wow. Um, and if you were to put it at 5% interest rates, then you're looking at one and a half trillion dollars of our tax dollars going to pay interest on our national debt. Instead of helping the homeless, instead of creating better roads, instead of creating better schools and hospitals, et cetera. That's right. And then the big question, you know, everyone talks about it being a national security issue, um, that what if China decided not to buy our debt? They just walked away. Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't have the military. We wouldn't have the <laughs> police, the firemen, because the police and firemen get quite a bit of their money from, from national governments, not just local governments. So you you have a huge you know we're, we're they the world has us by the you know what's China's already doing that in Africa, where they go out there to they'll, they'll build an airport they'll build the hospital if the African the African country can't pay it, China comes in and repossesses it, just like anything else yeah. that, that you would owe like a like a car repo or yeah. a home foreclosure. But but to to speak also about why people should care today is that we are printing money to pay interest on our debt. So so it's not just our kids and our grandkids that are going to be left with this debt. It's impacting us today. And you don't feel it. It's sort of like the slow virus that, mm -hmm. that you don't feel every single moment of the day, but it but it's inside your system and it's killing you. And that's what's happening right now when we print money to pay interest on our debt. Is there anything that voters can do and investors can do to make sure that they stand up for this to stop? Is it, uh, is it being independent of any government services or, or what, what's the, what's the, maybe the short or long-term fix to that? Well, the, the one fix is for us to drill here Our in the oil. United States. Yeah. Yeah. We have $25 trillion worth of oil and natural gas right here in the United States. That's what the estimates are. And probably right here in Texas. <laughs> we, <laughs> well, we, we got could it right be. in Texas. <laughs> could be. Um, and, and then to stop the spending. But that's not going to happen because people are constantly wanting, you know, new bridges and new roads and new infrastructure projects because our infrastructure is falling apart. The challenge, I mean, California, Newsom just approved health care for illegal immigrants. Yeah. We got, we got people, the most amount of people crossing the board in record numbers have been happening in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Just people, and politicians are there at the board just watching them just cross. They're doing nothing. A bunch of my buddies have been activated. And two, two of my buddies, one's on, uh, in the Marine Corps and one's in the Army. They both got activated to gum down, help out, bur watching them cross the border because they have no power to arrest. And then Governor Abbott says, hey, we need to arrest these guys. Yep. Biden says, no, you're not. <laughs> I, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no logic behind why Biden is letting this border be open. It's crazy. And you know the idea is now there's a discussion about just giving mass amnesty to everybody. Because you can't keep, they're just trying to, instead of tracking everything, making sure everything, they're just kind of, okay, just. Right. And there was some discussion today about a card, a universal card that gives you, you know, your driver's license, your voting rights, and so on. And this is what the plan is. And we're just sitting here watching it happen. Mm. Yeah. So it's so being more involved in the process. You know, I, I was never, I didn't care before about politics, never was a political person. But once I started understanding how these policies are affecting our lives, our businesses, our, 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 com our communities, I started paying more attention. I think there's a, that famous play to quote said, to not understand, to at least not understand politics is to one day be ruled by your inferiors. And here we are. Mm -hmm. So we, we got we to have a resurgence on, on paying attention to this. So, um, you know, so to, to my other question there was, if, if, um, if this is the year of rising interest rates and this is going to be a, an election year, you know, from an from a economic empowerment standpoint, opportunities or dangers of 2024, what's the best and greatest, in your opinion, from the outside looking? It could be some form of, I don't care, some form of investment or something holistic. What's the best investment somebody can make today? In 2024. Well, just uh, I, I think you meant interest rates are going to be dropping, not rising. Excuse me. Correct. Yes. Dropping. Um, I think the best publicly traded investment are utilities. Okay. Because the cost to generate energy has dropped. Natural gas prices have dropped quite a bit. They're down 50% 12, over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a big windfall for earnings for utilities. Yeah. Plus, the dividends on utilities are going to become more attractive. 
Okay. So I think utilities look really attractive. And those pay, usually pay dividends too. So it's an income income producing That's right. type of investment. Income too. and growth. Yeah. And then on a private side, uh, you know, this is going to sound kind of crazy, and bizarre, but uh, wines, <laughs> liquor. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 wine investing is really attractive. How come? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But but I know I I mean. It's driven by women, driven by our wives. We're shopping on Amazon, right. clicking on Amazon. You know. But Vino Vest is a company that does a great job at securing high-end wines, and they they secure them in London, and they sell them off, and they average about fifteen to sixteen percent a year. So let's just make sure that these aren't wines that you buy to drink. These are wines that you buy to invest in and put in a safe area. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but wines and also whiskey barrels. Uh, whiskey barrels uh, return about thirty percent a year. Barrels, yeah, the oak barrels. Like, like, like uh, after after aging or before aging, like like fresh or after they've aged. Empty barrels. Well, okay, brand new, brand new barrels. Okay. Yeah, Got it. but they can be used over and over again. Yeah, yeah, because they. And I'm I'm a cigar guy. Am I? Are you, are you a cigar guy? No, I'm not. Yeah, I got you. Okay, well, maybe you're a whiskey guy. Are you, are you a liquor guy? Yes. Whiskey and, and, and wine. Yes. Okay. Well, maybe find somewhere outside <laughs> where you can drink your whiskey. I'll join you too, but I'll smoke downwind. <laughs> no, I like the smell of cigars. I just don't smoke them. No kidding. <clears throat> right, did you ever? You no. Ever, really? It, yeah, you, I've you, never smoked anything. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Very good. Well, good. Pure. I, I my got mother it. smoked and <clears throat> I just never <clears throat> always swore I never it's another thing about me I've never had a sip of coffee in my life what <clears throat> never no coffee no cigars wow goodness gracious well, who, will you ever will, we ever will we ever try it no <laughs> my kids know when I go to my death I will have never had a sip of coffee or smoked a cigarette that's awesome man listen, well listen I, I I'm, I'm, I'm we need to do another. Forty-five. You said forty-five. You, you wanted to explain a little bit more of the the the, uh, the index that you were talking about earlier. Break break some other things down. Maybe. If you guys would love to have Ed Bataz to come back and break things down some more, please drop in the comments before uh, before you uh, step away. Make sure you hit like, drop a comment, subscribe to our channel because we got a lot more conversations like this happening in twenty twenty four. So uh, with that being said, uh, Ed, I appreciate you coming by. And uh, I thank you for investing your time into this podcast. We did the Invest Live show back in the day, and it's we awesome should to yeah, right, to, to, for nostalgia purposes, for sure. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we might do it in some clips and uh, do some reactions to that, man. But uh, nonetheless, uh, make sure you guys uh, invest wisely in 2024. Um, you know, this has been pretty, this is going to be a chaotic year. And you know, sometimes a lot of people run away from chaos. You now, what have you observed what the wealthy do in times of chaos? You look through all of the news lines and you find out what is <clears throat> really going to impact financially. Like the war in Israel is not a major economic event. Hmm. Okay, just isn't. Wow. The, the, the GDP of all of those countries combined isn't even uh, 3% of wow. the world GDP. So it's really not relevant, wow. except okay. for the shipping lanes in the Red Sea. Right, because they're going around Africa now and still yeah. coming through. And well, there it is. Go through headlines and sift through the riffraff, and there's your opportunity. So with that being said, guys, happy new year to you guys. Make sure you subscribe, like, drop your comments below. And make sure you share this content with those that you love and care about so therefore they can be part of the seven-figure squad to us out. That being said, from Dallas, Texas, on behalf of Ed Batowski, I'm your money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to smart, continue to smart, and be money smart today. See you next week.